Here is a review of hypothesis testing, which is something that we use in AP Bio. So to begin, there are two different types of hypotheses in a hypothesis test. We have the null, um, or H with the subscript zero, or the alternative, H with the subscript A. The null hypothesis states that the experimental group is no different than the control. In other words, there's no cause and effect, um, there's no difference between the two groups or multiple groups. Whereas with the alternative hypothesis, uh, we say that the experimental group is different than the control um, or there is some type of cause and effect happening. So for example, um, let's say you were watching an advertisement and they were um, advertising a fancy eye cream to reduce wrinkles and you're wondering, does it really work? So your null hypothesis would be um, that the type of treatment has no effect on the amount of wrinkles. So whether someone uses that fancy eye cream or whether they don't is going to have no impact on their amount of wrinkles. Whereas with the alternative hypothesis, um, you could say this in a couple different ways, but basically the type of treatment does have an effect on the amount of wrinkles. So the two groups are not going to be equal. Either using the fancy eye cream is going to reduce wrinkles, maybe it isn't going to work as well as something else, um, but those two groups are different. And these are just a couple different ways in which you could phrase the null and alternative hypotheses. So in order to use hypothesis testing and, and draw conclusions with our null and alternative hypothesis, we do need to use um, some different statistical measures, the standard deviation um, and standard error of the mean. In AP Bio, you do not need to know how to calculate these. You will not be asked to calculate them or memorize these equations. These appear on the formula sheet. Um, but we do want to understand generally what they mean and how we will use them. So standard deviation just refers to kind of the variance in the data. So when you have large standard deviation, like on the left, we're seeing a big range in our numbers. They're all over the place. Whereas a small standard deviation is when the numbers are going to be more closely together or more compact, um, like we see here on the right. So what this might look like if we were to represent it graphically, a small standard deviation, all of the numbers from our data are centered around a specific point, whereas with large standard deviation, it's more spread out. The way this may look on a line graph, um, so say we would expect our data to fit on a specific line with a specific equation. Um, if the data points are clustered and close together on that line, we'd say low standard deviation like on the right, whereas it would be a high standard deviation like the one on the left when the data points are really spread out from where we'd expect them to be. So the standard deviation is something we need in order to calculate the standard error of the mean. Again, not something you're asked to calculate in AP Bio, but what the standard error of the mean or SEM means is how accurate is your mean or your average. So when you collect data, you're collecting a sample of numbers in your experiment, and we're wondering how accurate is the average of those numbers, or how far is your sample mean or your average from your experiment from what it is in the population. So our experiment is just a small sample of what it would be like um, in the full population or the real world, right, where we would collect lots of different numbers. These things are happening lots of different times. Um, it's just how far is our experimental data from what the true data would be. So we then use the sample mean to calculate what we call a 95% confidence interval. So the interval itself is a range of numbers. Um, so we calculate it by taking our sample mean or the average from our data, and we go up two standard errors of the mean, and we also go down. So when we go down, that's the bottom part of our interval. When we go up, that's the top. And basically what this interval indicates um, is that we are 95% confident that the true value or the true mean lies within that interval. Um, that's just some language that would be used in statistics, um, but we do use these intervals to help determine um, if we're going to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis, and it'll help us know if we have statistically significant evidence or data. 
So in class, we did practice calculating the 95% confidence intervals. If you want to try again on your own, you can go ahead and practice. Okay, so if you did the practice on your own, here is how you would work through that data. So we would need to find the averages since we're trying to find the 95% confidence intervals. Um, so we have two different groups. We had the light. So we'd need to find an average for that. That was 30, 36, and 39. So if we add those all up, and then we divide by three, that would give us our average for that group, which was 35. And then we also need to find the average for the no light group. So however many groups you have or however many categories is however many confidence intervals you would need to calculate. So now we have 28, 21, and 25. Add those all up together. We get 74, divide it by three we get the average for the no light group, which would be 24 point, if we round, we can go six, seven. Now we are also told the standard error of the means. Remember, that's not something you'd have to calculate. So the one for no light was 3.51, and the one for light was 2.65. So we could then use this to calculate our confidence interval. So we have x bar plus or minus two standard error of the mean. So I could plug in my numbers, 35 plus or minus two times 2.65. Then that is 35 plus or minus 2.65. So then that is my range. Now, if I want to actually know the, the bottom of the interval and the top of the interval, I would do to get the bottom 35 minus 5.3, which is 29.7. And then to get the top of my range, I do 35 plus 5.3, which is 40.3. So that is my range or my interval for light. Now I would do the same thing for no light. So I have 24.67 plus or minus two times 3.51. Okay, so two times 3.51 is 7.02. Right, so there is my interval. Now, if I actually find the top and the bottom of the numbers or the range of my interval, I would do 24.67 minus 7.02 to get the bottom. So that's 17.65. And the top of it would be 24.67 plus 7.02, which is 31.69. So there are my intervals, okay? Now what I'd need to do using these intervals, if I were to determine what to do with my hypotheses, I'd wanna see if they would overlap. So one way you could do that is just look at the numbers and I could see, yes, they do overlap, right? This one goes all the way up to 31.69 and the light goes all the way down to 29.7. So there is some overlap in the intervals there. Now what that would look like if we were to graph it. So right now this is just a sketch of the graph, but basically here's my graph. I would have my light bar. So let's say that's 35, right? Cause it goes up to 35. And then I would also show my average for no light, which was 24.67. So let's just say that was around there. So I graph the averages with the bar and then my error bars I'm gonna show with little lines. So I would graph 
the top of my error bar, 31.69, and I'd also go and graph to the bottom one. So basically you go up to standard error of the mean and you also go down. So I would do the same thing on the other one and we would see, again, if this was graphed properly, uh, we would see some overlap. So you can see right here, there's overlap between my intervals. So when there's overlap, we would reject the alternative and we would fail to reject the null. And now after watching that practice, if you wanted to, here's what we actually do with those numbers. So you can graph your 95% confidence intervals. And the way that they're graphed is you do a normal bar graph um, of the averages for your data. So the averages from your categories. And then you can put the confidence interval as an error bar. So it goes up two standard errors of the mean and down, and it shows your interval on the graph. If those intervals overlap, then we would fail to reject the null hypothesis and we would reject the alternative. So if they're overlapping, so the bars overlap, um, we do not have significant evidence that there is a difference between the two groups. Whereas if those 95% confidence intervals do not overlap, like here on the left, we would reject the null hypothesis and support or accept the alternative. So like here on the left, we do have statistically significant data or evidence um, to support that there is a difference between the shady and sunny leaf habitat in terms of the mean width of the leaf in centimeters. So all about the confidence intervals and if they're overlapping or not is how we determine what to do about our hypotheses. So this is, um, again, those conclusions you can draw and some phrasing that usually works um, when you're writing maybe in an AP question or something like that. So if um, the confidence intervals are overlapping, we do not have statistically significant data and we would fail to reject the null. If the confidence intervals do not overlap, then we have statistically significant data. We can reject the null and support the alternative um, again, because those error bars are not overlapping. Some common misconceptions and some language to be sure that you're not using. We do not say that we accept the null. We never accept the null. We only can reject it or fail to reject it. Um, we also would never say that we have proven the alternative hypothesis to be true. So you should never say, the alternative hypothesis is correct or my experiment has proven the alternative hypothesis. All we can do is support um, the alternative hypothesis. You could also say accept it, um, but we'd never say we've proven the alternative.